It was deeply scooped from a corner of the field, a green stagnant hollow with thorn bushes on its banks. From time to time, something moved cautiously beneath the prickly branches that were laden with red autumn berries. It whistled and murmured coaxingly. Come, 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 it whispered, an old man squatting frog-like on the bank. Come now, little dear, here's a bit of meat for thee. He tossed a tiny scrap of something into the pool. The weed rippled sluggishly. The old man sighed and shifted. He was crouching on his haunches because the bank was damp. He froze. The green slime had parted on the far side of the pool. The disturbance travelled to the bank opposite and a large frog drew itself half out of the water. It stayed quite still, watching. Then with a swift crawl it was clear of the water. Its yellow throat throbbed. Little dear, breathed the old man. He did not move. He waited, letting the frog grow accustomed to the air and slippery earth. When he judged the moment to be right, he made a low grating sound in his throat. He saw the frog listen. The sound was subtly like the call of its own kind. The old man paused, then made it again. This time the frog answered. It sprang into the pool, sending the green weed slopping and swam strongly. Only its eyes showed above the water. It crawled out a few feet distant from the old man and looked up the bank, as if eager to find the frog it had heard. The old man waited patiently. The frog hopped twice up the bank. His hand was moving, so slowly that it did not seem to move, towards the handle of the light net at his side. He gripped it, watching the still frog. Suddenly he struck. A sweep of the net and its wire frame whacked the ground about the frog. It leaped frantically, but was helpless in the green mesh. Dear, oh my dear, said the old man delightedly. He stood with much difficulty and pain, his foot on the thin rod. His joints had stiffened, and it was some minutes before he could go to the net. The frog was still struggling desperately. He closed the net round its body and picked both up together. Ah, big beauty, he said. Pretty, handsome fellow you. He carefully killed the creature through the mouth so that its skin would not be damaged, then put it in his pocket. It was the last frog in the pond. He lashed the water with the handle, and the weed swirled and bobbed. There was no sign of life now but the little flies that flitted on the surface. Hobbling through the grass, with the sun striking a long shadow from him, he felt the weight of the dead frog in his pocket, and was glad. Big beauty, he murmured again. The cottage was small and dry and ugly and very old. Its windows gave little light, and they had coloured panels, dark blue and green, that gave the rooms the appearance of being under the sea. The old man lit a lamp, for the sun had set, and the light became more cheerful. He put the frog on a plate and poked the fire, and when he was warm again, took off his coat. He settled down close beside the lamp, and took a sharp knife from the drawer of the table. With great care and patience, he began to skin the frog. He would speak aloud to the dead creature, coaxing and cajoling it when he found the task more difficult. He dropped the stripped body into a pan of boiling water on the fire and sat humming and fingering the limp, slippery skin. Pretty, he said, you'll be so handsome. There was a stump of black soap in the drawer and he took it out to rub the skin with the slow, over-careful motion that showed age in his hand. He left it at last, and brewed himself a pot of tea. Well away from the fire stood a high table, its top covered by a square of dark cloth supported on a frame. There was a faint smell of decay. How are you, little dears? said the old man. He lifted the covering with shaky scrupulousness. Beneath the wire support were dozens of stuffed frogs. All had been posed in human attitudes, 
dressed in tiny coats and breeches to the fashion of an earlier time. There were ladies and gentlemen and bowing flunkies. One, with lace at his yellow waxen throat, held a wooden wine cup. To the dried forepaw of its neighbour was stitched a tiny glassless monocle, raised to a black button eye. A third had a midget pipe pressed into its jaws with a wisp of wool for smoke. The same coarse wool, clean and shaped, served the ladies for their miniature wigs. They wore long skirts and carried fans. The old man looked proudly over the stiff little figures. In the middle of the table, three of the creatures were fixed in the attitudes of a dance. Soon we'll have a partner for the lady there. He'll be the handsomest of the whole company, my dear, so don't forget to smile at him and look your prettiest. He hurried back to the fireplace and lifted the pan, poured off the steaming water into the bucket. One by one he found the delicate bones in the pan, knowing each for what it was. Now, little duke, we have all of them that we need. We can make you into a picture indeed, the bow of the ball, and such an object of jealousy for the lovely ladies. With wire and thread he fashioned a stiff little skeleton, binding in the bones to preserve the proportions. At the top went the skull. The frog's skin had lost its earlier limpness. He threaded a needle, eyeing it close to the lamp. From the table drawer he now brought out a loose wad of wool. This wool is coarse, I know, little friend, a poor substitute to fill that skin of yours, you may say. Wool from the hedges, snatched by the thorns from a sheep's back. He was pulling the wad into tufts of the size he required. But you'll find it gives you such a springiness that you'll thank me for it. Now, carefully does it. With perfect concentration, he worked his needle through the skin, drawing it together round the wool with almost untraceable stitches. A piece of lace in your left hand, or shall it be a quizzing glass? With tiny scissors, he trimmed away a fragment of skin. But wait, it's a dance and it is your right hand that we must see, guiding the lady. Suddenly, he lowered his needle. He listened. Puzzled, he put down the half-stuffed skin and went to the door and opened it. The sky was dark now. He heard the sound more clearly. He knew it was coming from the pond, a far-off, harsh croaking as of a great many frogs. He frowned. In the wall cupboard he found a lantern ready trimmed and lit it with a flickering splinter. He put on an overcoat and hat, remembering his earlier chill. Lastly, he took his net. He went very cautiously. About twenty yards from the pool he stopped and listened. There was no wind, and the noise astonished him. Hundreds of frogs must have travelled through the fields to this spot. From other water where danger had arisen, perhaps, or drought, he had heard of such instances. Almost on tiptoe, he crept towards the pond. He was a few paces from it when, without warning, every sound ceased. He froze again. There was absolute silence. Not even a watery plop or splashing told that one frog out of all those hundreds had dived for shelter into the weed. It was strange. He stepped forward and heard his boots brushing the grass. He brought the net up across his chest, ready to strike if he saw anything move. He came to the thorn bushes and still heard no sound. Yet to judge by the noise they had made, they should be hopping in dozens from beneath his feet. Peering, he made the throaty noise which had called the frog that afternoon. The hush continued. He looked down at where the water must be. The surface of the pond, shadowed by the bushes, was too dark to be seen. He shivered and waited. Gradually, as he stood, he became aware of a smell. There was a soft, oozy bubbling. Gases must be rising from the mud at the bottom. It would not do to stay in this place and risk his health. Pulling his net to a ready position, he tried the throaty call for the last time. Instantly, he threw himself backwards with a cry. A vast, belching bubble of foul air shot from the pool. 
Another gushed up past his head, then another. Great patches of slimy weed were flung high among the thorn branches. The whole pond seemed to boil. He turned blindly to escape and stepped into the thorns. He was in agony. He felt the net whipped from his hand. The icy weeds were wet on his face. Reeds lashed him. Then he was in the midst of an immense, pulsating softness that yielded and received and held him. He knew he was shrieking. He knew there was no one to hear him. An hour after the sun had risen, the rain slackened to a light drizzle. A policeman cycled slowly on the road that ran by the cottage, shaking out his cape with one hand and half expecting the old man to appear and call out a comment on the weather. Then he caught sight of the lamp still burning feebly in the kitchen and dismounted. He found the door ajar. He called the old man. He saw the uncommon handiwork lying on the table as if it had been suddenly dropped and the unused bed. For half an hour the policeman searched in the neighbourhood of the cottage, calling out the old man's name at intervals, before remembering the pond. He turned towards the stile. Climbing over it, he frowned and began to hurry. He was disturbed by what he saw. On the bank of the pond crouched a naked figure. The policeman went closer. He saw it was the old man on his haunches. His arms were straight, the hands resting between his feet. He did not move. Hello there. The policeman ducked to avoid the thorn bushes catching his helmet. This won't do, you know. You can get into trouble. He saw the green slime in the old man's beard and the staring eyes. His spine chilled. With an unprofessional distaste, he quickly put out a hand and took the old man by the upper arm. It was cold. He shivered and moved the arm gently. Then he groaned and ran from the pond, for the arm had come away at the shoulder. Reeds and green water plants and slime tumbled from the broken joint. As the old man fell backwards, tiny green stitches glistened across his belly. George Parsons was reading The Pond by Nigel Neal. The producer was Pamela Howe. And next Sunday at the same time, there's something large and snorting lurking in the dark as Edward de Souza reads Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's spectral short story, Playing with Fire. You're leaving the seventh dimension. And so another weekend of dimensional delights has drawn to a close. But I'll be here again next Saturday when we reboot the virtual reality of our series Planet B to see how avatars Medley and Kip are doing in their desperate bid to save their reality. And that'll be followed by more from Ghost Zone by Marty Ross 